Thank you very much, and uh, <clears throat> it's good to be back with you on this Sunday. And I want to just thank you for having me for a few weeks during this time between Pastor Dave and your new pastor. It's really been a blessing to me, uh, and I ask God's blessing on you as a congregation as your new pastor comes in May. Uh, some of you know I have one of your mugs. And uh, throughout the week, I don't use it every day, but I use it sometimes during the week. Sometime, one or two times during the week, I will take the Mount Bethel mug uh, for my coffee in the morning, and that gives me an opportunity to remember you and to pray for you. And when Pastor Dave was here, he would send out the, uh, the midweek, I, I call it the midweek update or the update on, on the church. And... Um, I was on that list, so I want you to know I'd like to stay on that list if your new pastor uh, continues to do that, uh, because that uh, keeps me informed of the congregation here and what's happening in your life. So it's been a nice uh, relationship. I thank uh, Fred for the opportunity once again. Uh, I've been filling in periodically ever since Pastor Dave uh, Babbitt. Pastor uh, B was here. So, and I want you to know <clears throat> what a blessing it is for me to come and to listen to Bridget and the team that's with her. Um, I used to get in a lot of churches. Now I'm very selective in the churches I get into. And not everybody has a worship team that uh, produces mu music that's balanced. And uh, they work together uh, well. Just this morning you have not only Bridget on the keyboard, <clears throat> but you have the percussion who knows how to support very well, and the guitar. And, and sometimes you get in churches where the percussionists think they're leading, and uh, you have all uh, what I call dissonance going on. Uh, but this is a very balanced, and then the choice of songs that Bridget picks, uh, it's just tremendous and the ones that you write are right on. So I'm gonna recommend Bridget um, periodically if there's a conference going on someplace, and I'm gonna say, oh, you need somebody to lead worship? Uh, here's somebody, contact uh, Bridget. <laughs> so thank you very much, it's been a, been a real joy. And then it gives me opportunity when I come to study and to prepare something and uh, uh, that uh, ministers to me and hopefully ministers to you. Now this is Palm Sunday and uh, Palm Sunday uh, to me my mind always goes back to where I grew up in Myerstown, Pennsylvania and when we grew up of course this was the beginning of Easter week and <clears throat> back then growing up this was the the time of the year when uh, Easter, as it's approaching, was the, I had two sisters, and so when Easter came, they could wear white shoes, and they could wear uh, spring dresses and things like that. Uh, up to that point, you didn't, you didn't wear white shoes during the winter. Remember anybody? Is that, is that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, in fact, we remark, Carol and I remark as we watch uh, the news and uh, you see individuals in the winter time with short sleeve dresses and white shoes. That never happened until after Easter. But then in addition to those things, it was almost like the official start of spring for me uh, was uh, Easter week. But in the town that I grew up, they would have midweek services. And so uh, at the Myerstown High School, when I was in uh, the grades coming up, um, we would uh, always have uh, an, like an hour off and we, we would go up to the Methodist church and there, that was not far from the, from the uh, school. And people from the town would come in and they would have the midweek service. It was only like a half an hour long. Uh, we walk up, we go to the service and then back uh, to school. And so every day there was a midweek service. Now, I don't remember what was said. But I do remember that church had a balcony. 
And so I would be on the balcony with my buddies, and uh, now can you picture this? This is, this is uh, what happens when you are a uh, young person growing up in Myerstown. So we would go, and this is kind of fun, to be able to go to the church and sit on the balcony and uh, here was a podium and of course the pastors from the town would be up there and each one would take a, 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 a turn uh, each day. And right in the center was a chandelier. So I was in the back there and my mind used to say, you know, if there was a rope tied to that chandelier, I could swing down and hit the podium. You know, it was things like that would go through my mind. And can you imagine, if that happens to any of you while I speak, you know, the words, you could one day be a minister in churches. That's why the people in that town still shake their head. How did this ever happen that you became a, a minister? And I remember the time on that balcony, and on the balcony there was no rug. It was all wood, floor, and then the tiers. Uh, it was not a large church, but I remember when they took the offering, and of course, up top there, the, we all had our pennies and nickels, and they put them in. And I remember somebody dropped the offering plate. You know, these kids, you know, you're going, and boom, there goes. And then all you heard were the chains, you know, rolling down the wooden floor to the front, and then people scrambling to put it back in. Well, anyway, those are my time. But, but Easter week, it started with Palm Sunday. And... In my mind, as I'm coming up to Palm Sunday, that's what I'm thinking about. The significance of this week. Not only the impact those early days had on me, but then to be able to transition now as an adult, one who studies the word, to what this week means. And so Palm Sunday, it kicks it off. And it's Holy Week. And... <clears throat> So it begins with Palm Sunday. And in the book of Matthew, we know about the triumphal entry. But then as the week progresses from Sunday, and you move uh, towards uh, uh, the middle of the week, you have uh, Jesus uh, gathering with his disciples in the upper room to observe the Passover meal, the Last Supper. And along with that, according to John, there's the washing of the disciples' feet. And so it starts off with Palm Sunday, and it moves to the Last Supper and the washing of the feet of the disciples by Jesus. Then, of course, on Friday, you have <clears throat> the crucifixion. Now, in the town that I grew up, when Friday came, the businesses in that small town would shut down from 12 to 3. Everything kind of shut down. Then after 3 o'clock, it would open again. Now, down through the years, I personally realize that culture has changed and business has changed and businesses don't shut down. But I have always kind of been by myself and reflected from 12 to 3. Most of the time I'd be in my study because being in churches I was getting ready for Sunday Easter service when 12 to 3 came it was almost like I was there and my mind from 12 to 3 would reflect on the crucifixion of our Lord. And then I would move Saturday and then into Sunday Easter. And so it begins with Palm Sunday. You move to the middle of the week, the Last Supper, and Thursday, and then the crucifixion on Friday. And then on Easter, Sunday, you have the resurrection. Now, as you go through this week, 
hopefully your focus will progress and when you come to Friday you will be thoughtful about what was taking place on that day and that today's message and what we do here today will have an impact on your thinking particularly on that day and then you come next Sunday and celebrate the resurrection now as you look at Holy Week right between the Last Supper the washing of the, Jesus, uh, the disciples feet by Jesus and the crucifixion you have a very significant event and that event is found in Matthew 26 and it's Jesus going out into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray and I put in the bulletin, I had uh, Mary put in the bulletin a section of scripture uh, from Matthew, Mark, and also Luke. And so if you can have that on your lap with your Bible, because periodically I'm going to refer to that section. But we're going to focus this morning on that special event that took place when Jesus went into the garden uh, to pray and keep in mind it's following the Last Supper and prior to the crucifixion it's Jesus prayer in the garden and here is a famous painting of Jesus praying in the garden by a Warner Solomon uh, and that is his depiction of Jesus prayer in the garden and a number of people have found uh, comfort and solace by uh, looking at this picture particularly as they have gone through difficulties uh, those of you who particularly appreciate art uh, might want to look this up and uh, this is a famous painting of Jesus in the garden that some churches that have stained glass uh, windows and things like that it may be found in some churches but Jesus prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane now <clears throat> following the Last Supper where Jesus explained to his disciples once more that he would shortly be put to death now keep in mind as he was with his disciples wherever they went he would go over and over this same theme that he would one day uh, be put to death and so now he's with his disciples in the upper room and uh, observing the Last Supper and as part of that supper he takes the element and explains once again and illustrates to them what's going to happen in uh, just a short time that he's going to be put to death and then following that, and by the way, keep in mind, the disciples said, no, that, that, that's, not, no, that's not going to happen. Come on, come on. That's not going to happen to you. In other words, whenever he would get on that subject, one of them, particularly Peter or somebody, would say, now, come, now, 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 come on, that's, that's not going to happen. It's almost like you're at a family gathering and somebody brings up, come on, come on. Not here. We're ever with group and somebody all of a sudden starts coming out with something that's going to disrupt the uh, situation. You know, they're going to say something and kind of put a damper on it. What well, Jesus would go through what's going to happen. Would decide, but come, it's not going to happen. Don't worry. Over and over. So the Last Supper, he explained and took the elements and illustrated what was going to happen. And following that, he goes out into the Garden of Gethsemane, which is on the Mount of Olives, the mount that consisted of olive trees. Gethsemane means oil press, so you have olive trees, and throughout the olive groves, in the, in the olive groves, you would have an oil press. They would take the olives and they would uh, mash them and get the oil out and so Gethsemane uh, the garden that contained an oil press 
on the Mount of Olives. And so when you look today at Israel and you go to Israel, you'll see olive trees and you'll have paths like this. And most likely in Jesus' time, that was not a nice stone path. Uh, but uh, today there are paths and you have olive trees and these seem to be spaced out. Uh, on my mind, back then, they were probably not planted. As they were When they were planted, they were not spaced out as they are nicely today. And there is a picture of an old uh, oil press. Large round stone, and they would put the olives in there and then roll that stone around. A heavy stone would crush them. And then there would be a section where the oil would run out and into uh, a container. Now, this to me is more likely a picture uh, during the time of Jesus because you have uh, more growth. Um, it's not as cleared out. And there you would have the press uh, right there and... Uh, uh, probably the stone down here uh, in the front is where the oil would, would probably roll out and, uh, and run off and get into that uh, container. Uh, and so he would go, he went out in, on the Mount of Olives where there were olive trees and probably to an area where you have this oil press. Now the prayer in Gethsemane is found in Matthew chapter 26, which I have on the sheet. Now I want to say, uh, along with Craig Blazing, uh, I was in school uh, at Dallas Seminary uh, with Craig Blazing, and he says this, there are many conflicting interpretations uh, that have been offered uh, regarding this passage of Scripture. And what I'm about to unfold to you. So there's many interpretations and they conflict with one another. And it serves as a warning to those who would examine it today to proceed with caution and above all with reverence. And so I'm planning to do that. I'm planning to proceed with caution, handling the word of God with care. And at the same time, asking God for a proper understanding of the passage so that the passage itself speaks and that I don't just come up with a interpretation uh, that um, is about the scripture. And so I swear, that's, as I approach this, that's how I approach it. Now, the passage begins in Matthew 26, verse 36 and 37. And so you'll see it right before you, and I'll have it up here on the screen. So you can look at the screen or you can follow along in the, on the passage. Verse 36, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, oil press, and said to his disciples, sit here a while while I go over there and pray. Verse 37, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. Remember, we have the twelve, and then without, within the twelve you have the three, Peter, James, and John. Peter's mentioned first, James and John are usually there. So you have the three, and you have the rest of the twelve, and then as he moved about there were the seventy and so forth. And so he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And as he's moving toward probably that oil press, he began to be grieved and distressed. Now, when you look at this, uh, these words, the expressions in the original language describe the emotions that are exceedingly strong. I mean, this is not just uh, a, a warm feeling or, or a shock feeling. This is extremely strong and seemed to be used in a crescendo-like fashion. And so as he's moving, the words to describe it are almost stair-step 
in their emotion. Now, Matthew 30, uh, 26, verse 37 says that he was grieved and distressed. You see that? If you underline, you might want to underline grieved and distressed. Now, look at verse 38. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved. So you have grieved, distressed, deeply grieved. So as he's moving out there, he has this emotion coming over him. He's grieved, distressed, deeply grieved. Now go over to Mark 33. This is a parallel passage from Mark. Verse 32, he came to a place called Gethsemane. Verse 33, and he took with him Peter, James, and John and began to become very distressed and very troubled. So you have distressed and troubled. Now look at verse 34. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved. So you see this stair step again. Distressed, troubled, deeply grieved. So as he moves closer and closer, this is coming upon him. Now, so Mark's account is even stronger than Matthew's, and it's a picture of shock and dismay and horror, horror as he's moving towards something. Verse 38 of Matthew, then he said, my soul is deeply grieved. The, NIV, the King James has exceedingly sorrowful, overwhelmed with sorrow. So as he's moving with his disciples out there, you see this stair step emotional effect. Now, so it denotes being in the grip of shuddering horror in the face of dreadful prospect of what is, what is facing him as he moves towards that oil press properly. Winston Churchill's title of his first work regarding the approaching or the uh, World War II history, his first volume, he, he uh, titled that The Gathering Storm. So as you move towards World War II, Winston Churchill pictured that as a gathering storm that was going to break loose with World War II. And so he titled, entitled his first work uh, on his history, the gathering storm. So think of that as he's moving, the gathering storm. Now, picture uh, in my mind's eye, the, uh, to kind of get a feel for this effect on him, the closest I can come to is taking a mother and father who are told that their child has been brutally murdered. And even to, to think about it, you don't even want to think about it. But if I put myself in their shoes as the uh, forensic people are taking them to the site and scene of the murder, what effect that must have on them. Now I watch the first 48. Anybody else a fan of that program? 48 hours? You can raise your hand. <laughs> I don't watch much TV, but I have to admit, I like I tape it because I don't want to waste my time in the extremely long 15 commercials. But I watch that, the first 48, because there's always a crime that takes place, uh, usually a murder. And then the story, as they try to, they have 48 hours, and within the first 40 hours, if you get a lead, your chances of solving that are greater. And I'm always watching to the end, because I want the criminal caught, and I want the criminal, I want justice. So I watch it, but a lot of times I get mad at the end, because the person only had like two years probation for a murder, or three years in jail. When they ought to be put away for life, or, I don't want to 
upset anybody if you have a different opinion, but. <laughs> so watching that first 48, you know, it comes back to my mind because I'm thinking, if I was taken to a crime scene where my child and I had to identify, I would not only be in shock and horror, but as you're approaching, I can't even imagine the effect on me as those steps toward the crime scene. And so you have the prayer. He went a little beyond them, verse 39, and fell on his face and prayed. My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not my will, but as thou wilt. So you picture Jesus and the emotions, and then when he gets there, Father, it's possible, let this cup pass from me. What was he seeing? That's the issue. The construction that this prayer has this is a premise followed by B. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. It expresses this condition, expresses conditions which are believed by the speaker to be possible. If it is possible, and it is, let this cup pass from me. And so, if you put that in, his prayer is, my father, if it is possible, and from the mind of the speaker, it is, let this cup pass from me. What was he saying? Let this cup pass from me. Do you have a human asking God from the human side, if it's possible, let there be another way? If it's possible to accomplish the objective of paying for the sins of mankind, let there be another way. Is that what we're saying? Or as this is approaching, Good Friday, is it possible that this would pass him by and not affect him? Your interpretation is going to be crucial. Let this cup pass from me. Is it a clash of wills? Not my will, but your will be done. So you have that's going on and you have people on various sides of the interpretation. So the first thing I want to do is, what's the cup? It's a picture of the wrath of God. This is common in the Old Testament of the God's wrath being held in a cup and somebody drinking that and experiencing the wrath of God. It's a figure that primarily comes from the Old Testament. And you'll see a number of scriptures here. Uh, if you will, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna turn back to Psalm 11.6. If you wanna turn there with me, Psalm 11.6. I won't do all of them, but uh, the, the passages are numerous in the Old Testament and they all have the same concept with the cup. Notice 11.6. Psalm 11.6. Upon the wicked he rain, will rain snares. Fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. So the picture in the psalmist's mind is a cup that God is holding and in that cup are fire and brimstone and wrath. And when that is poured out, 
the person suffers. That's common. You go down through the scripture. In Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, Zechariah. You have a common theme and it refers predominantly to God's wrath and punishment being poured out upon his people. Now let's turn, if you will, to Isaiah 51. Isaiah, go back. Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Isaiah 51. I'll read verse 17 and I'll go to verse 21. Just for you to see that there is a concept that is very prevalent regarding the cup. Rouse yourself, rouse yourself, arise, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the Lord's hand the cup of his anger. The chalice of reeling you have drained to the dregs, to the bottom. In other words, when God poured out his wrath and anger upon Israel, you have the destruction of Jerusalem. It's pictured in lamentation. The, the writer in poetic language pictures a cup of God's wrath being poured out and the nation of Israel, so to speak, drinking from that, not taking just a sip, but draining it to the bottom with all the mud and the gunk, I think of coffee grounds, in the bottom, the dregs, of when you made wine, the, 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 whatever that goo, that slush is at the bottom. In other words, every last, last ounce of God's wrath was poured out. And they would drink that. Lamentations has the same thing. And you go back after Isaiah, go to Jeremiah, and then after Jeremiah, Lamentations. Just uh, to look at Lamentations, chapter 4, verse 21. Lamentations 4, <coughs> verse 21. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, who dwells in the land of Oz. The cup will come around to you as well. And you will become drunk, not with wine, but when that cup is poured out and you drink the wrath of God, you're going to just be staggering around as if you were drunk and fall down. In other words, it's going to hit you. The cup will come around to you as well, and you will become drunk and make yourself naked. In other words, they will just be devastated. That's lamentation. So if you turn back now to Matthew 26 and have that passage in front of you. And what we are talking about now is the meaning of the cup. When he says, let this cup pass from me, the cup refers to the wrath of God being poured out. Now, look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, My father, if it is possible, and it is, let this cup pass from me. Go over to Mark, if you will. Mark 35. And he would have went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray, if it were possible, that the hour might pass him by. So the cup passing by, Mark says that the hour will pass by. In other words, pass by when it arrives. I got up this morning, I said I had to leave at a certain time. So I had my phone set to the alarm go off. I need to be going out the door when that alarm goes off the door. So when that time came, the alarm went off, I'm out the door, and time goes on. I arrived here a little after nine. My goal was a few minutes after nine. 
So when I got here, that time came and went by. Service begins at 10. We're waiting. That time came and the hour keeps going. Next thing you know, it's 10.01 and we're off. And the sermon begins. It seems like it stopped. <laughs> During the sermon, it seems like time stops, doesn't it? But it's moving, and before long, it'll be over. So the passing by is not that time would somehow skirt around us, but that when it comes, and the hour comes, it would keep on going and pass by. So notice that this cup that he's going to drink at a certain point in time. What happens if time stops? When he's crushed and the iniquity is poured out of him and he's put in the grave. If time stops and that hour stops, he stays in the grave. But what happens? Once the hour passes by, and the cup is removed. <coughs> Similar to when it was removed from Israel. Rise yourself, Israel. <coughs> Go back to the land. So when the cup is removed, the resurrection is able to take place. So as you move towards Friday, Friday's significant. And this prayer helps me understand Friday when it comes. What's going to happen? The cup of God's wrath is going to be poured out on the righteous one. And he's paying for our sins. He was crushed because of our sins and iniquities. But the hour of it keeps going. And the cup is lifted. The resurrection takes place. So that's what he's praying for. Not that somehow he skirts the issue, but as he approaches, he realizes, in fact, this is your will, oh God, and I've come to do your will. That the hour would pass by, not around him or skirt him, and he's not trying to get out of something. He's actually praying as he's moving towards that event. Now, he went a little beyond it, verse 39. My Father, it's possible, and it is, let this cup pass from me, pass by after it arrives. May it pass by, Mark, pass by. But, notice Luke, go over, if you will, to the right side. Parallel passage from Luke. Verse 41 and verse 42. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. He knelt down and he began to pray, saying, Father, if you're willing, and you are, remove this cup from me. So remove helps us to understand, coupled with passing by, that the hour would pass by. And when the cup is poured out, that the cup would be removed. Allowing the resurrection to take place. Notice Mark 36. <clears throat> Go to verse 35 first. It's possible when it is, let the hour that the hour might pass him by. Come and go. Now look at verse 36. All things are possible for thee. Remove this cup from me. So his prayer is that the hour would pass by. What does that mean? That the cup would be removed as the hour and time continued to go on. So Jesus prayed that the hour when he would drink the cup of God's wrath would pass by once it arrived. And then he prayed that the cup of God's wrath would be removed once he drank it. Now, when you come to verse 39 in Matthew, he says, yet 
this is not as I'm willing, but this is your will, O oh God. Now, yet is a Greek little word, tuta. And it's a pronoun that actually, according to Ballard and Gengrich, which is a common dictionary of Greek, says should be translated this. In other words, Father, it's possible, and it is, let this cup pass from me, remove the cup. This is not my will, but this is your will. So his prayer in the garden is that the, ultimately the cup would be removed. I'm going to throw a few scripture up here. Notice what John chapter 12 says, what the, what the John writes. He says, my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? This is Jesus speaking. Father, save me and deliver me from this hour? Get me out of this hour? The answer that's expected in the original is no! I'm not asking to get out of this hour. For this purpose and this hour I came into the world. So Jesus is praying not to get out of it. He realizes he came into the world to go to the cross. What he's praying is that when he's on that cross and suffering the wrath of God and drinking the cup of all the wrath because of our sin, that ultimately that cup would be removed from him once he's in the grave. And when God removes it, the tomb is open and he's resurrected. John chapter 4. Jesus said to them, My food is what? To do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work, which was going to the cross. So you don't have a schizophrenic Jesus. You have a Jesus who's perfectly aligned and his scriptures line up. For this purpose he came in. John chapter 6, verse 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me, which was to go to the cross. Now the most important scripture dealing with this, I think, is Hebrews. Because Hebrews says his prayer is answered. So the prayer in the garden was answered. Notice, in the days of his flesh, when he was on this earth, he went out in the garden of Gethsemane when he offered up prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to him who was able to deliver him, to save him out of death. Not to avoid going to death, but once he's experienced death and he died and he goes separation of the spirit from the soul, or from the body, when you have that separation take place and his body's put into the grave, he was delivered out of death. And that spirit's joined with that resurrected body and ultimately he walked the earth for days until his final ascension. Now notice, he was heard. So his prayer was that the cup would be removed and he would be delivered out of death and the resurrection would take place. So we're in Holy Week. It begins today. He comes in, the triumphal entry. Everybody, hey, come on, do a miracle. Hey, all right, all right. Hey, Jesus, come on. Let's see, let's see another miracle. And as you move through the week, you're going to come the Thursday evening. And I want you to think of this prayer. And then you're going to come to Friday. And 12 noon is going to come from 12 to 3. Picture him on the cross. And the cup of God's wrath being poured out. He's going to be taken off that cross and put in the tomb. 
Somehow from 12 to 3, it slows down for me. Every good Friday. And then when you approach Sunday morning, the cup is removed. The tomb is open. And out from the grave, he comes. And so when you come back to church next Sunday, you're coming back to celebrate the fact that what he did on the cross and the fact that God brought him out and a resurrected Jesus proves that he was who he said he was. And if he was who he said he was, he did on the cross what he said he was going to do, pay for your sins and mine. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Sometimes passages are difficult to understand. But somehow ingrain and impress upon our minds not only the events of this week, but particularly what took place on Friday. When we come to Friday, I pray that somehow in the midst of all we're doing, that our minds might realize afresh and anew that you were drinking the cup of God's wrath for our benefit. And we celebrate next week the glorious resurrection. In your name, amen.